Hello, AP Macro students, and welcome back to AP Daily Practice Sessions. My name is Matt Romano. I'm coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, Marist School. And today, we're going to look at some FRQs. These FRQs are going to run from Unit 1 to Unit 3. It's a, it's a cumulative class. You know that. So we're going to stop at about Unit 3, but everything up to that point is subject to show up. All right, first question. Assume the economy of Anderson land is in long-run equilibrium with full employment. In the short run, nominal wages are fixed. Always read that first sentence carefully. Pull something out. There's going to be something there that you need throughout the question. So, part A, draw a correctly labeled graph of short run aggregate supply, long run aggregate supply, and aggregate demand. Show each of the following. Equilibrium output labeled Y1, equilibrium price level labeled PL1. All right. With FRQs, a lot of FRQs, not all, but a lot of the FRQ is follow the directions. And, and part of that is following verb prompts. Know your verbs. Look for verbs. Actively look for verbs. I'm going to highlight them whenever we come to them. So in this first part of this first question, they're telling me to draw something. They're telling me to show something. Follow those directions. Now, when drawing a graph, I'm sure you've heard this before, ace your graphs. Okay, keep that, that word ace in the back of your mind. Ace means make sure you identify your axes, your curves, and your equilibrium. If you do that every time, you will earn points. So here's what our graph ought to look like. We should have price level and real GDP on our axes. We should have AD, SRAS, and LRAS all accurately identified. They should be intersecting at the same point because our initial prompt said we're at long run equilibrium, which means full employment of output. So we have Y1 and PL1 right there. So two points total here. If you just draw the graph correctly, you get two points. First point, the correctly labeled graph with PL1. The second point is by putting LRAS in the correct place so that we know where full employment output is. Second part, part B. Assume there's an increase in exports from Anderson Land. On your graph in part A, show the effects of higher exports on the equilibrium in the short run, labeling new equilibrium output and price level Y2 and PL2 respectively. There's your verb, show. So I have to do something. I'm going to go back to my original graph. I'm not going to draw a new graph. I'm going to go back to my original graph in part A, and I'm going to show what happened. So remember, always ace your graph. We're going to show a rightward shift of AD. AD shifts to the right, and as a result of AD shifting to the right, price level goes up, PL2, that's demand pull inflation. Output goes up from Y1 to Y2, so we're operating an output level beyond full employment. Again, you earn points just by showing that stuff, so follow directions. And you're a good shape. You already have three points right now if that's all you've done. Part C. Based on your answer to Part B, what is the impact of higher exports on real wages in the short run? Explain. Okay, there's your verb this time. Explain. The what is is really just an identification. That's a short answer. You can answer it in a word or two. Explain is going to require a little bit more. Not necessarily a complete sentence, but some explanation, some identification of a causal relationship. What caused that assertion? Now, before we can get there, how do we solve the problem? What's the impact of higher exports on real wages in the short run? Well, let's address real wages. One way to look at real wages is to consider that real wages are simply nominal wages divided by price level. This is actually using an equation you must have learned, you should have learned way back in unit two. We are told that nominal wages aren't changing. It says so right up there in the prompt. In the short run, nominal wages are fixed. That is a, an assertion, that is an assumption that we make in all of our models. Price level went up. Remember, aggregate demand shifted to the right. So as price level went up with no change in nominal wages, our real wages are gonna go down. Real wages will fall. That's the first part. That's the assertion. That's the answer to the first question. What's the impact? Because, anytime you have explain, think about putting the word because in your answer. Real wages will fall because price level is increased and the nominal wages are fixed in the short run. You could use this equation to answer the problem. You could use it in your answer and earn credit for it. So, real wages falling because price level has gone up with nominal wages fixed. Part D. As a result of the increase in exports, so we're still on that increase in exports, shifting AD to the right, expert-oriented industries in Anderson land increase expenditures on new container ships and equipment. All right, DI, what component of aggregate demand will change? 
DII, what's the impact on the long run aggregate supply? Explain. There's your explain again. We're going to have to come up with a causal relationship. But before that, let's identify the component of aggregate demand. So as a reminder, there are four components to aggregate demand, C, I, G, N, X, consumption, investment, government spending, net exports. I've got to figure out which one of those corresponds with export-oriented industries increasing spending on container ships and equipment. What is that? Well, hopefully it's obvious that's investment spending. Remember, investment spending is business spending. They're, they're purchasing capital. They're developing capital. It's capital formation of some sort. So in the short run, we're going to see investment spending affecting aggregate demand that way. They're spending money, in this case, on new ships and, and equipment. So investment component will change. Part two, part double I, what's that going to do to long-run aggregate supply? Well, I just said it. In the short run, that change in investment affects aggregate demand. But in the long run, it's going to have a different impact. Work backwards to get there. We're looking for a change in long-run aggregate supply. So why does long-run aggregate supply change? It changes because of productivity changes. Well, what leads to a productivity change? Productivity changes happen because of capital formation, the development of new capital. Capital formation comes from investment spending. There's your connection. In the long run, investment spending leads to capital formation, leads to productivity gains, leads to a shift in LRAS. As a result, Long run aggregate supply will shift to the right because the capital stock has increased. That's your textbook answer to the question. You could phrase it a lot of different ways, but that's your textbook answer to the question. All right, let's move on to another question. Assume the country of Fisherland produces only consumer goods and capital goods, and they've given us a PPC. Look at that, throwing it back to unit one here. Part A, the graph shows the production possibilities curve for Fisherland. The production of which of the following exhibits increasing opportunity cost? Consumer goods only, capital goods only, both goods, or neither good? So we're looking for increasing opportunity cost. How do we know this? The only way we know without data is to look at the shape of the curve. And the fact that we have this bowed outward shape to the PPC tells me that we have increasing opportunity cost, and it's increasing opportunity cost for both. That's the only option possible. This is, notice it's a multiple choice question. You've got to pick one of those four. Part B, redraw the graph given above. Yes, it is possible that you would have to redraw the graph that you were given in the question. Show a point that represents fully employed and efficiently used resources on the redrawn graph and label it A. So we have our graph, we've drawn our graph, it's properly labeled, remember to ace your graph. And then we've got to show point A where we have efficient use of resources. It should be obvious. Point A is going to be on the curve. Doesn't matter where on the curve. It could be anywhere on the curve, but it's got to be on the curve. So one point earned by simply putting point A on the curve. Part C. Assume there's a recession in Fisherland. On your graph in Part B, label as C a point representing the recession. What is a recession again? A recession is that extended period of declining output, declining employment, how would we show that here on a PPC? Well, the recession is going to be an output level that's below the curve. So I simply put point C anywhere inside the curve, and that's going to earn me the point. Part D, identify a fiscal policy action that the, that the Fisher Land government can take to address the recession. Okay, so again, let's acknowledge what we're dealing with here. We need a fiscal policy action. It's not asking just direction and action that the Fisherland government can take, and they're trying to address the recession. So we need expansionary policy. We gotta remind ourselves, what are the policy tools? What are the actions possible? Under an expansionary policy, we're trying to shift 80 to the right. There are two tools, really three, two tools of fiscal policy, spending and transfers kind of go together, and then taxes being the other one. Because we're trying to cure a recession or address a recession, we're trying to increase aggregate demand. We're going to want to increase our spending and tra transfers. We're going to want to decrease our taxes. Our correct answer is going to be to identify increasing government spending or decreasing taxes. Either of those would do. But if we only said expansionary fiscal policy, that's not going to answer the question. It's specifically asking you to identify an action, not just a direction. So your response has got to say either increase spending, increase transfers, or decrease taxes. All right, part E, 
Assume instead no discretionary policy actions are taken. Will short run aggregate supply increase, decrease, or remain the same in the long run? Explain. Once again, define the problem. What are they asking me? They're saying, assume government doesn't do anything. Policymakers don't do anything. What's going to happen to aggregate supply? In this case, they're walking you right up to the correct response. We've got to be able to explain how and why long run self adjustment occurs when output is below full employment, when we have a recessionary gap. And we have to first identify the change and then explain that change. The beauty of it is, it's the same story every time. We're gonna have an increase in short run aggregate supply as a result of a decrease in resource prices. And you can see, this is the textbook answer here. SRES will increase because wages and some other production costs decrease during a recession. You have underutilized idle resources. They're going to be cheaper. And as they get cheaper, SRES shifts to the right. That is always the correct response when we're dealing with long run self adjustment. All right. Finally, one more question. The government budget of the country of G land is currently balanced. The government budget is composed of tax revenues, T, transfer payments, TR, and government spending, G. Part A. Assume the economy moves into a recession and there is no discretionary policy action. Will the government budget move into a deficit or a surplus in the short run? Explain using the appropriate components of the government budget identified above. And then based on your answer to AI, what will happen to the government's debt? So let's focus on transfers and taxes. You've moved into a recession, outputs going down, employment's going down. As a result, Transfer payments in the form of unemployment compensation go up. Tax revenue, on the other hand, is going to go down. That combination is going to lead us, in, is going to lead us into a budget deficit. With tax revenues falling, transfer payments increasing, now that government spending is greater than tax revenue. That's a deficit. Based on that answer, the fact that we now have a deficit government debt is going to increase. Debt is simply the sum of all budget balances. Part B, based on your answer to AI, identify one specific fiscal policy action that will balance the budget. Remember, action means we have to come up with an actual action. And they're trying to balance the budget. This is not a, a counter cyclical policy necessarily. We're trying to balance this, the fact that government spending exceeds tax revenue. Well, the only way they can do that is to either decrease spending and transfers or increase taxes, expansionary policy is not going to do it. They're going to have to apply a contractionary policy and in doing so, bring the budget back into balance. Your answer would have to be either decrease spending and transfers or increase taxes. That takes us to part C. How will the fiscal policy action from part B affect the actual unemployment rate in the short run? Explain. Well, we just had a contractionary policy, spending down, taxes up, that's gonna shift AD left, that's gonna decrease output, that's gonna increase the unemployment rate, the actual unemployment rate is gonna go up in the short run. And then finally, did the government's efforts to maintain a balanced budget make GLAN's recession more severe or less severe in the short run? Explain. Well, it was a contractionary policy during a recession, those efforts to balance the budget are gonna make a recession more severe. If we're on ADAS, we're gonna move further away from that full employment level. While maintaining the balanced budget, the government had to implement a contractionary fiscal policy during a recession. All right, I wanna thank you for watching today's AP Daily. Please come back for more. We've got a couple more sessions to go. Remember, as you're doing these, whether it's FRQ or MCQ, a problem well-defined is half solved. Thanks a lot.